Hello, my name is Apostate Ashley. And today I have Catherine Roberts with me. And Catherine is a member of the Clergy Project along with me, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization exclusive to ex-pastors mostly. Uh, there are a few current pastors on their way out that are a part of it, but exclusively for ex-pastors who have dismissed their faith of any kind. The majority of us are ex-Christian pastors. And Catherine is a friend of mine that I met from the Clergy Project. And she's gonna share her story today about how she got into religion, how she got into the ministry and how she got out slash why she got out. <laughs> so, hey, Ashley, how are you doing? Good. How about you? Uh, well, you know, it's been a rough year, but uh, thank God it's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, for me, 2022 was worse than uh, 2020. So, uh, but here's to uh, better things in the new year, hey? <laughs> Yeah, and look at us on the screen again together. I know, I know, because the I mean, we did unordained together, which was how I really started to get to know you, because mm -hmm. it was it was pretty much this what I'm doing, and yes. so I got yeah. the idea from you essentially to start doing the interviews for the clergy project. Like I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. The clergy project is uh, is an organization that is one of the top three that um, I would find uh, uh, that I would say was supportive for me and my husband when we both deconverted at the same time. Um, it was a lifesaver for us. So it's a great organization, and it's a it's a good one to be getting the word out there. For, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. It's been it's been amazing for me as well. It, yeah, and because yeah. Of the friendships and yeah, the, the things that we have in common, you yeah. know, especially yeah. like you and I, we came from evangelical backgrounds. Yeah, so, we had a lot of the same. Uh, we had a lot of the same beliefs. I think uh, you and I did. So and we yeah. were in a lot of the same kinds of services, and yeah, yep. So um, I wasn't uh, I wasn't always a, a Christian. I think like you, you pretty much you were. Um, I think if I remember from your interview, you were a Christian from the time you were just a little girl. But I, yeah, was not, I, like I wasn't one. raised in a in a religious home at all. Like we didn't go to church. It just wasn't something that um, was a thing for for me. There was a couple of. Um, like I went to a funeral. I went to a couple of funerals when I was in high school and those were at churches. And I remember going to the Pentecostal funeral and I was so mad. I was only like 16 or 17, but it was like they were just preaching for to get everybody saved instead of having a funeral. And I remember being like, this is just ridiculous back then. I just did not like religion. I considered myself actually an atheist until I was about 28. Um, but I know now that I wasn't really an atheist. I was just um, I was just an atheist in the way that a lot of Christians think of <laughs> as, as atheists. You know, um, I guess I still kind of believed in a God. I just thought, like, you know, that this is just silly. You know, the Bible stuff is all silly and that kind of thing. But um, I never really questioned the existence of God. You know, I assume, always assume, Charlie Brown Christmas, right? They tell us that's the reason for the season. <laughs> On those, you're too young for Charlie Brown Christmas, <laughs> aren't no, you? No, <laughs> I had, I had the CD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's probably like that's the kind of exposure that I had to Christianity or religion growing up was just something that I just saw. Um, you know, incidentally on TV or that kind of thing, usually over Christmas. And, and, uh, but yeah, I was never raised religious at all. And then 
when I was um, uh, 19, I met my now husband, and he was from a very religious family. He was from a uh, very Pentecostal family. Almost everybody in his family are deeply religious. Um, and, uh, but still, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't actually, even when we got married and we had kids, it wasn't really an issue. It just wasn't a thing. It didn't fit into my life. It wasn't something that I ever really considered until I was about 28. Well, I was 28 and, um, I was going through a really, really hard time in my life. I had three little kids at home and, Sheldon and I were having uh, marital issue, issues and he was, I hadn't seen him in six months. Um, and I was really, really depressed. Like, um, oh, look at Kathy. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, I was really depressed and uh, actually probably suicidal um, at the time. And I remember talking to my friend. Okay. So I was really sad. I called my friend who happened to be a Christian and she just said some really, you know, some things to me that in my, in my, um, vulnerable, depressed, desperate, lonely state, I just sucked it up into my soul. You know, um, uh, I felt like nobody loved me. Nobody cared about me. And she told me that Jesus did. And, you know, God cares. And, um, and that, so that was like the first time in my, in my adult life that I actually, that I really prayed because I just thought it was all silliness. <laughs> that was and, like your early twenties or? Well, I was 28. And oh, here's the thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, when this, like this night that I prayed, and you know, ask God into my heart. This is what I always find strange about telling the stories, okay? Because the only way I can tell the stories is, is if I use the language that you and I used to have. You, you know what I mean? So when I say, like, you know, when I invited Jesus into my heart, I don't want, I don't mean to say that as I actually believed that I, you know, invited Jesus into my heart. But back then, I really believed it. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does make sense. Yeah, I really so thought I did too. <laughs> it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain it. Um, but I felt that I had a very deep spiritual um, awakening that night. Like I literally felt like the next day I got up and, you know, they say the sun is shining more and the sun, the sun is brighter and the grass is greener. The sky is bluer. That's how I felt. I felt like it was, I was, uh, um, I felt like I was renewed and, uh, and so I think what happened there was that was such a, um, transformative event for me that it cemented, like it took away all of my doubts right away. If, if that makes sense to you. Um, I didn't know of any, I didn't know of any other way that I could have been depressed one day and then not depressed the next day. Um, and I didn't have the support or the knowledge to be able to um, look at that and say, well, you know, maybe it could have been because, you know, you sat on the floor and cried for an hour. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that can be cathartic enough in itself. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, well, I quickly accepted that it was a supernatural experience. And that was the beginning of what I considered to be 20 something years of what I thought was supernatural experiences. And I went to church right away. Um, I was at home when I got saved <laughs> and, uh, I went to church right away and I was so loved. Oh, my God. I mean, church, there's nobody who can, nobody can love on you like church people can. <laughs> now, nobody can hate on you like church people do, can too, but that's besides the point. But a new person in church? Yeah. I mean, Christians are all over that, right? Oh, yeah. And so I had instant friends, instant social circle, um, instant social life. 
um, I suddenly went from having, you know, nothing in my life to having Bible studies and new converts class was the first thing, Sunday school for adults, um, prayer meeting, pre-service prayer and midweek uh, Bible studies. I just jumped in with both feet. Um, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. If um, I guess that's the way that I that I am anyway, if I'm going to do something, I guess I kind of might get a little bit obsessed with things. I don't know. But um, I don't see the point of doing something halfway. I mean, I truly believed it. And so my entire life looked like I believed it. It looked like it was it was real. You know, um, I went to went to church. I felt um I felt like I had such a change in my life that I wanted to bring that same change to other people. So I wanted to be, that's why I wanted to be in the ministry. And um, so within two weeks of me getting saved, again, I say that like it's a thing, but it's not a fucking thing. <laughs> but I thought it was a fucking thing. <laughs> but um yeah, so to, within two weeks of that event, I was speaking at a Sunday school class for teenagers and giving my testimony, <laughs> you know. Um, and I just, it, it started from there. And I started getting invitations to speak in other places. And I started looking for other ways to minister. Um, I got involved in the church. Like I, I taught things. I did things like VBS. Do you guys have VBS? Yeah, we do that too. Yeah. Yep. We, I, I did a couple of those as well. Yeah. So Let sweet. Them, I of them, you know, as a yeah. Kid. yeah. <laughs> I really, I liked it. I, I really liked with the kids and stuff. I mean, I wish it wasn't indoctrinating them, but it was really, um, it great. is fun. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, aside from when you're telling them creepy stories, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And then I started doing uh, very early in my Christian walk. I started doing uh, Christian uh, puppet shows. Did you know that about me? It was. I think yeah. I remember. You wanted to have fun. I do remember that because you were you were going to do that. Uh, Two truths and a lie. <laughs> and I think yeah. It was on that. One of those, yeah, yeah. I did puppet ministry for a while. I even went to like um, that was one kind of, of the like schools in the nineties, right? Was the puppet ministry? Yeah, and it was in the nineties too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, late nineties it was. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it was so oh my. I loved it, but I would write them. Like I would write the scripts um, and then a couple of the kids would, would be the puppets. And, you know, uh, we did a lesson every single week, every week I did it. <laughs> what kinds um, of lessons would you do? Would you do? Oh my God. All kinds no, of bullshit. Like, um, <laughs> oh, I remember one time doing one about Dave and Goliath and the fact that Goliath was almost 10 feet tall. And so I was standing on a chair and I had, I can't remember what it was, something that was really heavy, like a really heavy book or something, which was the size of the end of his sword and all that kind of stuff. So, oh, but I tell you this, one time I was, I was speaking um, and one of the kids in the front, and this little, little boy, I guess I was going on too long for him and he threw his head back and he said out loud, how much longer is this going to go on? <laughs> How much longer? <laughs> uh, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> oh, I've met a lot of very interesting people over the years. So I was a Christian for 20, I think it's like 24 years, something like that. Oh, wow. Um, so around the same time as me, too. Yeah. You Okay, so you became a Christian in your late 20s. Yeah. Or it became like starting to get more and more involved, right? You got um, it was like an overnight thing for me. I mean, I felt like I had that experience with, uh, you know, with the Holy Spirit in the in my bedroom. <laughs> and uh, and that was on like August the 6th, 1996. Bam. Just like that. I was 
totally converted and uh, jumped in with both feet and I consumed the Bible. I didn't want to read anything else. And then um, did you get your, the rest of your family involved? Um, well, my kids were little. So yes, I dragged them in immediately. Um, and then, um, and then my husband came home. Sheldon came back oh. um, after six months of being separated. Um, he came back and, uh, and then it was like, um, I was the praying, I was the praying wife and <laughs> Sheldon was the backslidden spouse. So every, <laughs> every prayer meeting was, you know, me praying for my, for my spouse and everything. So eventually after a few years of being harassed like that, he gave in and, uh, <laughs> He came in and, and uh, he became uh, a Christian. I mean, he, he believed it all, too. He was born in a Pentecostal family. So, um, yeah, deconstructing was harder, even harder on him than it was on me. And for me, it almost ruined me. Um, people think that those of us who were Christians and even to the point of being a minister and then we deconvert, they think it's just because we wanted to have fun or, you know, we didn't want to listen to the rules, follow the rules anymore. It's so ridiculous because it's a gut wrenching, life changing, you know, event. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not fun. Super heartbreaking that you're yeah. like, Oh my gosh, I was wrong that whole time. Yeah. And it, it's a loss of everything. Um, you know, in 20 something years, all of my friends of course were from the church. I mean, you, you weren't really supposed to have friends who weren't, right? I mean, you just can't be unequally yeah. yoked and, um, you know, all the verses. I realize and, how isolated you become. Yeah. Yeah. And then as a minister as well, when you go through trouble, when you go through, like, um, shit in life, like we all do, there's, like, a extra um, loneliness to it because – you really don't feel like you can go to the people in your church if you are in leadership, yeah. you know? So there's a lot of suffering and a lot of like with um, being alone, being lonely. I felt, I felt that a lot. Um, but at the same time, I did have like a very active social life, but I guess there's when your friends are determined, predetermined for you for the most part, um, because your friends are predetermined to, according to what church you go to. It was for me. I've moved over 30 times. Every time I moved, I just found the church that, you know, spoke in tongues. And uh, that's where that's where I went and I made my friends. <laughs> you know, so when you lose at the, you know, at the end, when uh, I realized that I didn't believe it anymore, it was a loss of everything. Everybody. um almost everybody in my life. So how, how long had you been a pastor for you and Sheldon um, before all that happened? Well, let me see. I, um, I went kind of like into in different ministries in, in different ways immediately. Like I was um, women's ministry leader. Um, I would do the Sunday morning services and then we moved to Nova Scotia and I became an associate pastor there um, in 2003. <clears throat> so I don't remember really a time that I wasn't actively in ministry. Like I've spoken all over Newfoundland, the province where I'm from. Um, I've spoken in several different provinces across Canada. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't remember a time really that I was not in some kind of ministry or at least really heavily involved in the church. Um, and then in 2011, I think it was after such, I think it was like 16 years. Maybe it wasn't quite that, but <clears throat> I got ordained, which is something that I was working towards for years. And yeah. it's not easy for a woman to get ordained. <laughs> not easy at all. Um, but uh, we had been pastoring a little church in Saskatchewan for a couple of years. And then uh, before we got ordained as um, the senior pastors, you had to put your 
your time in first. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So got ordained and went right back to the same church that we were already uh, pastors in. So, and uh, within a few years, I just didn't believe it anymore. <laughs> it's like work, I worked so hard to get there. I did Bible, uh, um, Bible school courses and, um, it's just like it seems like such a were your Bible schools of time through your church? No, I did. Um, do you know Andrew Womack? You heard of Andrew Womack's church? Uh, I don't think so. Mm. Uh, I anyway, uh, I can't remember the name of the his Bible school now. Karis Bible School. Um, he had a he has a or used to anyway a two year course. So I did that. Um. Yeah, I loved ministry. I loved it. I loved church. I loved the people in it. I loved preaching. Um, I can't say, I can say with, with all certainty that I did not leave church because I didn't like it or I was hurt or angry or because I loved it. If the doors were open in church, I was there. Did you guys do a lot of prayer services and you mentioned speaking in tongues. Yeah. Was, so is it fair to say that your church was probably a lot like mine, where it was more experienced based than it was? Yeah. Biblical yeah. Knowledge based. I, <laughs> sorry. I was ordained with Victory Churches International. Um, but you know, like denominations, it's really it's really hard because there's like what forty something thousand different denominations, and um, mostly the easiest way for me to describe it is like it was like a well, it was Pentecostal. But I know you Americans see Pentecostals as snake handlers and stuff, but that's not the same here in Canada. Like we've never had we've Pentecostals we don't handle do snakes here. Snake. What? We didn't do anything with snakes. I was Pentecostal. No. Oh, okay, okay. Because I said that one time <laughs> to somebody, and they were like, like Pentecostal, like holding, like handling the snakes and stuff. And I'm like, no, just you no. know, speaking in tongues and falling on the floor, like <laughs> yeah, the spirit, and yeah, drunk in the spirit. spirit. <laughs> oh my God, Ashley! Some of the things they talk about prayer. I mean, yeah, I believed I was a prayer warrior, and you know, um, when you saw. What's her, name? What's her name? Uh, Paula White. Uh, yeah. During COVID, remember when she was like uh, summoning angels? I mean, the video with the clip was all over, all over social media and stuff. That would have been me, or like that crazy <laughs> prophetic lady cat something or another with her with her big stick, and she's like commanding the weather. I don't know if you've seen her on on YouTube and stuff. Uh, yeah, I, that would have been me. <laughs> Wow, those are the kinds of things we would walk around town and pray over buildings, for example, like the Masonic Lodge. City, yeah, prayer walk. <laughs> did you ever did you ever do them to like Planned Parenthood or no. things like that, or was it like around Capitol buildings? No, so, not in our little town. It was just like, um, it was just like the <laughs> the really evil things, like like the Masonic Lodge and the Jehovah's Witness, <laughs> <laughs> just the real bad things, right? The bingo hall, <laughs> oh, where all the sinners gather. You guys um, thought that so. Masons were evil too? Oh yeah. Oh. Absolutely. They were they were the height of evil. <laughs> it's just oh, I believed all Never kinds of crazy things. Are that those people are doing in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I mean in my little town, almost everybody was a Mason back then anyway, but yeah, we really thought we were doing shit, you know. Going, <laughs> going to places and putting our hands on the brick wall and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, we'd be calling down warriors and you know calling down angels and oh my jesus yeah the stuff we did and the falling on the floor um 
or being slain in the spirit. That was, you know, we have prayer cloths to cover up the. To uh, be modest. Yeah, yeah. You don't want legs to be shown. And <laughs> yeah, we would train our we would train people in our church to be catchers. Did you have catchers? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because yep. back then when you prayed for anybody, they fell to the floor. <laughs> You know, like yeah. why doesn't it happen later on in the day somewhere else or later on in the week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, uh, I used to take my vacations to go to church. So, um, like I would go to, you just go to like, <clears throat> make church somewhere. Like I would look for where the revival was happening, you know, where. Oh. where... <laughs> Wherever, wherever God's spirit was moving at the time, uh, that's where I went for vacation. So I've been to the Toronto Airport Church a couple of times, well, a number of times. Oh. And I don't know if you're familiar, but if you want anything uh, entertaining, just Google that and <laughs> look at some of the videos because that's the kind of stuff that I was into. I mean, we had a pastor from that church come to our church. And I kid you not, he was he was whinnying like a horse during a sermon. Yeah. Oh, he's making horse noises. <laughs> Don't make me make them, Ashley. He was making horse noises. Can you oh, give yeah. me an example? That was a man. <laughs> that was a man, like the manifestations, you know, what we call the manifestations back then. People would bark like dogs. Um, yeah. They would howl at the moon. <laughs> Uh, People. Like groaning, like uh, like gro like uh, birth pains. Oh yeah, that was a word for yeah, that. Yeah, that one too. Yeah. Oh yes, travailing. That was travailing. So yeah, that was something that we believed. I believed in demons and angels. Um, I believed yep. in healing. Um, we were what we we used to call the word of faith. So we were very strict on the things that we were that we said, um, because we, we believe that our words, we would manifest, you know, what we, what we said. So there was always a lot of pressure to be positive. Um, even if it was the shittiest situation or, you know, you didn't have any real positivity, you just, or positivity, you just had to fake it, you know, and that was considered to be faith. And so, <clears throat> I suffer with depression, so I've had mental mental health issues my whole life, um, and I'll probably always be on on medication for anti for depression um, because they make me think straight. But for twenty something years, I didn't have the freedom to um, to get those. Sorry about that, my darling. <laughs> Um, I didn't have the freedom to take medicine for, uh, depression. So that loneliness, those times when I was really depressed and I would pray and like, they were really dark times. Like they, I think looking mm -hmm. back now, I can see that the periods of depression that I had over the years, especially, um, um, probably back in the, you know, early two thousands. It, it was considered a sin to go to have, you know, medication because you don't have faith. If you've got to take a pill to be happy, Jesus is not making you happy. And if Jesus is not making you happy, you got a problem. So yeah. I, I went unmedicated for years or I would take them for a little while and feel good. And then as soon as I felt good, I felt guilty for taking them and I would stop taking them. Yeah, so there was a lot of up and up and downs with that over the years. But now you take them and you're oh, so I, oh my God. When I started taking antidepressants again, which was like a little bit after um, I deconverted actually, um, I, I within a couple of weeks I woke up and I was just like, I felt like I was myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll never go back to feeling guilty for taking a medication. Yeah. That, for real. That helps me. 
but uh, yeah, it was it was like really frowned upon, um, even just to be sick, let alone uh, sad or depressed. That being being sad and depressed in our circles was probably worse than being a horrible sinner. You had to be positive all the time. Yeah, yeah. And we started were- every single service with this positive confession. Huh. We started every service with like positive confessions and stuff. And oh my gosh, yeah, it was so exhausting he, after a while. Like, publicly confess the good things and the bad things. Um, Can no, you guys do stuff? oh, well, yeah, well, that, that's another thing that was poisonous about Christianity is this whole thing with accountability where you have to confess your sins. <laughs> um, oh my god. I mean, what kind of, I don't know, what kind of control we gave to other people is just unbelievable, especially as women in church. Yeah. And because women had to be subservient to at least to one man. You had to be subservient to your husband at least, <laughs> right? And, uh, and your pastor. In some denominations, but you still had to have the man of the house and then yeah. even on top of that you know we, I, we would say the man of the house and then of the denomination and then yeah. like country <laughs> yeah well and that's the thing like you go you know you're in you're in church you have your um you have your leadership in church that you have to be accountable to and mm-hmm. then there's always like a, a district supervisor and then there's like a you know, the denominational head and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's there's really no, there's a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of things you can't do. I mean, I wasn't free to, I, well, I wasn't free to perform uh, like a same-sex marriage, for example, right? Oh. So, no. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah. It was, we've had, we had a lot of ups and downs during those 20-something years. And and what I, I, I got to say that, one of the things that bugs me the most is people who say that we weren't real Christians because we're not Christians now. Doesn't that irritate you? That's so annoying. Oh my God. It bugs the life out of me. So so what are you saying? I was just crazy that whole time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And like, no, it was so real to me. Yeah. And it's just based on, it's based on the fact that we used to believe and now we don't believe. So therefore, these people can totally uh, disregard decades <laughs> of our experience. Um, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, is that in those 20 years, not one person ever came up to me and said, I don't think you're a real Christian. I mean, so if I fooled myself, <laughs> if I wasn't a real believer, I fooled myself and I fooled everybody around me in 20 something years. Um, I never uh, had a problem with pastors giving me their pulpit to preach. I never had a problem with uh, pastors letting me do Bible studies, um, prayer meetings, anything like anything like that. Uh, so it's funny now that as soon as you stop believing, all these strangers are like, oh, yeah, well, you just weren't a real believer. And it's like, holy shit. Um, yeah. Oh, I was a real believer. All right. At what point did you um, decide that you didn't really think that you believed in it anymore? And what started to cause that? Well, I've always been like a curious person. I always, I want to know things. Like I, I like learning and I want to know things. So when I started, when I became a Christian and I started reading the Bible, I immediately had lots of questions like you probably did, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wish that way back then in the early days, like within the first couple of weeks when I started opening the Bible and seeing things like, um, let me see, like the what's her name who got raped by her brother um, and then she had to marry him. or she had to marry a rapist. I remember reading that story. <clears throat> I can't remember her name now. The Bible is slowly seeping out of my brain, by the way. Um, I but yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
um, yeah, she she had to marry her rapist, and I, and I remember thinking, this doesn't seem like a very godly thing. Um, I, I just wish I had questioned things way back then, and rather than accept the fact that everybody would say, well, you're just like a baby Christian, so you just got to accept that. You just got to just believe it now, and you'll understand it later, right? And then but later it turns into friggin' decades. And then within decades, you're believing all kinds of crazy shit. Like, you know, you're in a service where somebody is rolling on the floor and somebody is looking for gold dust on the floor. And, and another person is probably in the corner wailing and somebody is speaking in a language, somebody's on the floor. Like it's <laughs> all, you, you are, you are, it's almost like what like what is the word um like you're just desensitized from day one not to be not to look at it too critically mm -hmm. um you know like noah's ark and all you know all of those things we did in that and we talked about in that video the crazy the stupid things we used to believe um, yeah yeah fun yeah like i believed all of i believe the bible was literal i i it was every story in it actually happened. Like snakes talked and bushes talked and you know, whatever. It's the just, whole world flooded. The whole world flooded, um, you know, but you can't look too closely at it because it starts falling apart. And that's what happened. Um, we retired. We retired, we actually wow. retired early, which is a story completely in it and it's on its own. Um, because we went from homeless to retired in, in a few years, seven years. Um, <clears throat> and that's another thing I like to say when people say, oh, you just got offended by church. This man from our church uh, ripped us off in a Ponzi scheme so badly that we lost our business and our home and our car and we ended up homeless. And I still believed in Jesus for a good decade after that. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when we retired and we moved to this little tiny place in the middle of nowhere, we were able to get quiet. And and when we got away from the church, the church keeps you indoctrinated, right? Um, you have to keep going. There's there's pressure to go to church. There's pressure to, um, you know, watch search at certain uh, preachers and uh, in 20 years, I never read a secular book in 20 years. I read only Christian books. And yeah. so one, when you're in it, when you're in it, it's just like the momentum to stay in it um, is really great. And then when we retired and Sheldon and I would just sit around the fire and we would talk about God. This is really how we became atheists as we started talking about God, even more than we ever had. And I guess the freedom to be able to question the um, accuracy of some of the things that we believed. So we slowly, some of these harmful doctrines, we just started putting them away. Like for one, for example, was that homosexuality was, was a sin. That was probably one of the very first things that I felt like was immoral in the Bible. Um, yeah. It was immoral for God to tell me that I should not love my my kids or, you know, or gay people. <clears throat> and uh, so that was a, a topic that I kind of, you know, we deconstructed from pretty early on. Um, now, when I say early on, I mean, like it took us 20 freaking years because I was totally homophobic the whole time I was a, a, a minister. It's embarrassing. Oh, really? oh, God. Yeah. I tried to pray the gay away from everybody that I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, I hate it. I hate that. I, do that. Stuff, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I, I hate the harm that I did, um, especially to the LGBTQ community um, in that regard. Um, I can think of at least 10 people over the years that I counseled you know, about homosexuality being wrong and, and, uh, how to, how to stop doing it, <laughs> just stop it. <laughs> yeah. So, 
now I'm a marriage commissioner and I do free same sex marriages. Um, yeah, yeah, give a little bit back to the community. So my our deconstruction, uh, like most of it was very slow. So most of it took years, like the, the concept of hell, we had to deconstruct from that um, mm -hmm. because I couldn't see how I was preaching about a God who loved people. And then I couldn't figure out how hell fit into it. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? Really so, doesn't. Yeah. And then one day we were have one evening we were having a conversation with our um, um, our firstborn. She was here for a visit. Now all of our kids are, I mean, they're all in their thirties or close to it. Um, and they mentioned just some offhand comment. I don't even remember really what it was um, about how the earth could have been formed or what somebody else believed for the origins of mankind. I, I don't even remember what it was because it's not even important, but what it did was it was the very first time anybody in my life ever made me think, question, is there a God? Like, yeah. yeah. Not, not not anything about doctrine or the Bible or which religion is right or anything, which God is right. But it's the very first time. And I was almost, I was like 50. The very first time that I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. No God at all? And it was just from then on, well, like within days, it was just, we were kind of in shock. It, it It's like having a house of cards fall is what um, I said, what I, how I described it. I thought I had a big castle of evidence to support what I believed. And then I found out that it's just like a flimsy house of cards. And yeah. once that one card was flicked for me, once that one thing was gone, it just seemed like the world made sense. Like, everything made a lot more sense that there was no God. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it made well, sense. How long do you think that that, that that transition was for you? Well, we didn't know anybody who was an atheist and we didn't use the word atheist because I just thought atheists were evil people who hated God. Um, but it was such a shock to us. Like, I don't even, Ashley, I don't even know if I can explain to you two people in their 50s who have devoted their entire lives to Christianity, to Jesus, to the ministry, to spreading the word of God. And then all of a sudden to feel like uh, we were hoodwinked. And it was like we became two shells. There was nothing left. Our, it was it was like an empty end. It was horrible. Um, it happened just before we were taking a trip to uh, Cuba. And uh, I went to Cuba more depressed than I ever was in my whole life. To lose um, Jesus... I'm going to say for want of a better word, because I still haven't found a good phrase for um, what happens when you stop believing or you no longer believe. Cause I don't feel I like lost, I haven't lost faith. When I haven't I lost anything. Too, he got, he was like, he kept correcting me and saying, no, I didn't lose anything. I never had anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a loss. It's, it's a realization. It. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a realization. That, that's exactly what it was. And it wasn't a decision that we made. It wasn't a, a choice that I didn't get up one day and say, you know what? Fuck this. I'm not going to be Christian anymore. I don't believe in this anymore. I just became unconvinced over a period of time by examining the different, um, you know, the what my beliefs were based on. And and that was it. Um, so we went to Cuba. And we were way up on the ninth floor. And oh, I mean, oh, Ashley, I'm very open about talking about my mental health issues, by the way. Um, 
but I was so depressed. And I was up on like the ninth floor looking down the balcony. And I really thought it's just as well for me to jump. Like everything that I thought that was real in my whole life is not even real. Like, how do you trust anything after that? How do you trust yourself to make a decision when you find out after all of your life that you were not just wrong, but like seriously, harmfully wrong? I hurt a lot of people. You know, um, and mostly, mostly my kids, you know, raising them in a, such a fundamentalist um, home. But um, yeah, I. Um, How old were they when you guys got out, your kids? Well, they were, I think the youngest was like 25, 24, 25, something like that. So they were, they were all on, all on their own. My kids all left the, the day they finished their um, high school um, exams. They didn't even stick around for their graduation, neither of them. Um, and and I, I can see why. I mean, I, we always lived in, in small towns and my kids were belonged to the weird church. You know, um, they were different from all the other kids. They weren't allowed to go to dances or, um, you know, certain movies they weren't allowed to play pokemon they weren't allowed to watch harry potter um they weren't allowed to practice uh, take part in halloween so you know I, I made my kids lives very restricted very very restricted which will always be my biggest regret um but yeah they were they were adults they were all atheists before we were well i don't know if they would consider themselves atheists probably i think they do did they, do you, I mean, did they ever really believe? Did they buy into it? Oh, like yeah. Guys? Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, we raised them right from, I think the youngest, when I became a Christian, he was like two or something like that. He was just a baby. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I was the kind of mom that I prayed. They wouldn't go to the bus stop unless I laid hands on them and prayed for them, you know, before they went to the bus. Um, I got on the school council so that I could make sure that there wasn't going to be too much Halloween stuff going on. <laughs> not, my, not on my watch. <laughs> um, oh my yeah, I went to her. I went to my daughter's teacher and I said, they're not coloring black cats on Halloween. Oh, not even. No, that's that's a, demonic. Black, cat, huh? a black crayon and a black cat. No. <laughs> Wow. That's demonizing, right? <laughs> That's extra. It's stupid. It's embarrassing, but um, but you know, but you get into a very smart person to see all of that, see all of the delusion, and walk yeah. away from. It. Yeah. Um. It was. It was really. It took. It took a long time to. Um, I mean, I don't know if I want to use the word heal from the uh, the past, but probably yeah. it, it took a long time to deconstruct. There's a lot of um, um, issues that you don't think of. Um, we found ourselves completely 100 percent, totally alone with nobody to talk to. And it felt like the world had fallen apart. We turned on YouTube and. We turned on YouTube and typed in, is there a God? And um, Seth Andrews video, one of Seth Andrews videos came up and we watched that. And that was just the, that was the, the final click. <laughs> that was the final, uh, you know, card to follow when we watched the, um, started watching atheist videos and we realized, oh, yeah. This there are people out there that don't believe there are people like us who, you know, realize that they've been hoodwinked and got to start all over again. And that's so, what we found ourselves. I called yeah. the clergy project. Yeah. So so how long ago did you join the clergy project? Um, the clergy project was something that we found almost immediately. Um, and. Oh, I know it was because we were looking for, um, I needed counseling. 
um, deconstructing and from from faith like that is is very is it can be very traumatic um and you can't like who do you go to who do you go to and that's what i was like i need to talk to somebody who do i go to and yeah. somebody pointed me to the clergy project who then uh pointed me to the secular therapy project and i got myself some secular uh therapy and um it was, I started the day we came back from Cuba and it was just life changing. It was, it was, I needed it. Was yeah. Cuba a personal trip or was it a missions trip? No, it was just a, it was just a personal trip. Um, just a, just a getaway from here in the winter. <laughs> well, that's I never did any kind of missions trips. I mean, if, you know, when I was a Christian, if I went somewhere, it was to go to a good Good church. <laughs> I've been to Montreal, the church. I've been out to Edmonton for church. I've been all over, <laughs> all over Canada just to go to <laughs> conferences. So you came back from Cuba and you decided to start the therapy that yep. you got. Yeah. Project. Yeah. Yeah. Right away. Um, like, what was that? Four or five years ago? That was, oh, geez, yeah, probably five or six years ago now. Um, so. We've been here for six years now, so it's about five and a half years that we've been, we've been atheists. Um, it took a long time to be able to say that, that we were atheists. And, of course, I went through the stage that a lot of atheists go through and that on social media where I just kind of, you know, bashed everybody who believed. and. Um, and then I blocked everybody who believed. <laughs> so if you believe in Jesus, you are not on my Facebook. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Go it's ahead. just, I mean, I regret, I regret that now, but it was just so triggering at the time, like to, know. you know, scrolling through Facebook and all of your old friends are just like posting Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> God, I, I, I thought you were cool at one point. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so Trude Hell has a question uh, wanting to know how your relationship with your children mm. is. Oh, okay. that's a nice question. Thank you for asking. Um, we have a really good relationship with our kids now. Um, we have three. And I think we have, we've done a lot of, we've done a lot of healing, um, you know, from... Uh, just the way that they were raised and stuff. I, I raised uh, two, two of my kids were, were gay, two of the three. So that was not just a strict environment for them, but, you know, they were also, um, we tried to pray the gay away from them as well. So, um, yeah, a lot of talking and, but my kids are so forgiving and loving and um, just really resilient. So they still have, they still carry some of the, I'm, I'm sure they will probably always carry some of the trauma of being raised in that kind of environment. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, also <laughs> how great of a position to be in that all of you guys have walked away from that and yeah. stayed Together. So, I mean, like, if you think of, you know, a parent hurting you, hurting your yeah. feelings, sometimes all you want is for them to apologize and say that yeah. they were wrong. Yeah. So you can move forward. But yeah. sometimes people don't always do that. So the fact that you guys were like, no, seriously, we were wrong and we're really yeah. sorry about everything and we're changing our behavior and we yeah. think completely different. I mean, like, yeah. how much better could that be yeah I, I guess you know it was better late than never I, I suppose um I wish that we had seen it years and years and years I wish I'd never even gotten into it <laughs> of course um but um yeah they're 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 good they're good humans they're not kids anymore they're, they're good adults and good humans and they're they're happy and so that's and they're free to be themselves now. And we've apologized to them so much that they've said, please don't apologize anymore. 
but soon yeah. you're gonna apologize for apologizing so much yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah no yeah. that's that's really great though it is because a lot of families completely just fall apart you know yeah they do yeah they do. do that is really cool you and Sheldon have stayed together through this whole thing. Yeah, we've been married for, um, we've been together for 34 years, I think. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Do you yeah, want to tell me a little bit about the Ponzi scheme? Um, yeah, this guy from our church, um, oh, geez, he was, we were going to invest in these things. I don't even remember what it was now. And, uh, so we invested money. We got other people to invest money. Um, almost everybody in our church invested. Then he went to other churches and yada, yada, yada. Four million dollars later, he's in Panama uh, running from uh, <laughs> running from getting arrested for fraud. And so in those months, the uh, government uh, seized all of our assets so we had a, a business and uh, they seized our bank account. So we were immediately out of business. You can't operate a dealership if you don't have if you don't have a bank account. Um, and so within a year. Like I remember one winter, we didn't even have heat for two weeks and we had the kids were little um, and we but we had lost so much that we, you know, we just we couldn't even afford to put heat in the oil in the furnace oh wow um, yeah yeah and then we just couldn't pay the mortgage and we lost everything we the bank took the car the bank took the house um and we ended up living in a hotel for um a brief time and uh yeah yeah and we started we started over sheldon got a job um and we started with nothing. We borrowed two lawn chairs from the neighbors where we were living and a blow up mattress. Um, and that's what we, we started off all over again after being married for 20 years, I think something like that. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. It was, it was devastating. So believe 10 years so, after that. Oh yeah. Like 10 more years. Oh Yes. Oh yeah. Yep, for sure. I believed that God was all over that situation. Mm -hmm. And we used to tell this story. Uh, we went to church when we were homeless. We went to a church uh, to visit and we ended up having lunch with the pastor and a few of the board members. And then the next day, one of those people showed up at our hotel where we were living with an envelope with $500 in it. And that five hundred dollars was the was given to us the last minute of like we had to get out of the hotel. We were going to be living in our truck at that point if that money didn't come through. Um, so you know that was we gave that testimony all over the place <laughs> about, about God coming through for us. Um, but then that you know, I back, money. yeah, I look back now at it though and say. <laughs> Well, we went to church. We went to a, a, a bunch of people who are famous for giving. I mean, we used to, we believed in giving. Um, and then we told everybody at the table what happened to us, that we lost our car and our house and we got nowhere to live and we got no money. Um, and so is it really that much of a coincidence that somebody showed up the next day with money? No. <laughs> <laughs> but in our, in our minds then it was like that was proof that God was real. <laughs> yeah. Now, if he was real, he could have, I guess, maybe not, we couldn't have avoided the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> you could have, like, first place and not in the situation to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he was down in Panama for years. He's, he, uh, they extradited him back to Canada to uh, stand trial. And that was just a big thing. And yeah. Anyway, he's free again now. Oh, great. Lots of people, um, lots of people lost their life savings over it. Oh, yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of the worst times of my life, losing everything and, and sitting in this house that we, uh, the house came with Sheldon's job and we were sitting there with 
the two lawn chairs and thinking like how in the world what are we going to do we didn't have a bed to put our kids in we didn't have and we didn't have a cup to have tea in not a thing and that wasn't as hard as restarting when i deconverted it was harder to start over without the god belief than it was starting over after losing all of our possessions and what do you mean by that? Because of the heartbreak? Of yeah, it was. How much time because, was in that? Well, yeah, when we lost things, it was like, it was just a loss of things. And it was, you know, it was stressful, but it was something that happened to us, right? Mm -hmm. But then when we, when I, when I deconstructed, it was really like a losing of myself for, for quite a, a while, you know? Um, it really messes you with your mind when you realize that you've been indoctrinated to um, in this upside down world. It is it is really like an upside down universe where the more you believe something with no evidence, the more faith you have. And that's a good thing. You know, um, if you're sick, you're you're frowned upon if you go to a doctor, but you're praised if you're just believe in Jesus. You know, it's, it's all of these upside down things. You don't have enough money for, um, you know, to feed the kids. Well, then you should take your last $20 and give it to somebody else. And mm -hmm. so it, it's just a, it's a whole mind, um, you know, uh, messes with your mind. And it, it took a lot to really start over to find out. You got to learn who you, who you are. You have to find out who you really are. That That's how I, how I felt. Yeah. We reprogram. Yes. Yeah. What do I really like? How do I really feel about these issues like abortion or homosexuality? How do I feel really about politics? How, you know, how do I really feel about sex or what kind of movies do I like to watch? You know, mm -hmm. turns out I like horror movies. Yeah. <laughs> I never would have watched them before. I know. Or Harry yeah. Potter. <laughs> I've watched all of the Harry Potter movies now. <laughs> yeah, I was a crazy one in my family that wouldn't watch them or read them. Yeah. And they were all fanatics. Yeah. Did you believe that you were going to get demonized if you read it? Oh, yeah. I thought it was an open door. Yeah. Yeah. Right, For sure. Right, right to hell. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so um, what was... So when you guys left, you had already retired. So by the time that you guys stopped believing, you didn't have a well, big. I no, I wasn't in the ministry. Um, I wasn't in. The, we weren't in the ministry at all when uh, when we actually deconstructed. We had retired. I had given up the church. Um, we had a. We uh, we had a different business and it was like we were both working 80 hours a week. Um, and so when we retired and gave everything up. Yeah. I, so, yeah, I wasn't a, a minister when I deconstructed. Yeah, I, that would have been even harder. I can't imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine all of these pastors who, you know, like yesterday had to get up to the pulpit and give some kind of a message that resonates with them and doesn't uh you know uh compromise who they really are and there's a lot there's a lot of them out there there's a lot of the pastors who are um going through the motions because they got to yeah right? and not they to be deceitful to. but because yeah it's scary to walk away i mean it's yeah. your it's maybe everything to you financially um, yeah community yeah. wise <laughs> family yeah well, if it's all that you've ever done and, yeah. you know, I mean, if you worked, you know, if you were a lawyer all of your life and then all of a sudden you realize that you could no longer be a lawyer, you know, that's, you know, that that's quite, uh, quite unsettling. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pastors out there. And I would say, I, I, I would imagine that they're doing their best to give the kind of messages that you know, that they can still stand behind without, you know, yeah. without coming up with the indoctrinational uh, 
give a shit. Definitely just making things a little bit more progressive. Yeah, like Joel Osteen, you know, I mean, what kind of threat is Joel Osteen? I mean, he just gives, <laughs> <laughs> his messages are just, just positive thinking. Uh, yeah. Prosperity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We were big into prosperity, too. <laughs> so, uh, how are how have things been for you and your family since you walked away? You said about five or six years ago. Yeah, yeah probably about five and a half years ago now, I guess it's been. Um, what is it like for you guys now? Well, the first year was rough. Uh, the first year, like it took us a lot of. Um, yeah, it, the first year was kind of rough, but at the same time, we were, it was also kind of exciting and fun because we were exploring the world in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I felt like, like a, like a virgin out there, <laughs> you know, I was a worldly virgin, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, like just, to, I didn't, I didn't taste whiskey, for example, until I was 50. Um yeah, wow. I never, um, I had my first hangover. <laughs> Those kinds of things, you know, um, watching horror movies and, and just kind of finding out what life was like. Just to be able to read a book that wasn't a Christian book felt like a little bit guilty, <laughs> you know, a little yeah. bit um, bad. But yeah, um, so the first year was just kind of, we, we might have gone a little bit crazy. I don't know. <laughs> um since then it's been a lot of growth i love my life i love it um having a have, living your life in such a way that you look at things rationally is so much more freeing than trying to than living by this faith you know um just being rational, making your decisions. It's just, it, it, it might sound like people might take it for granted, but we didn't, I didn't have that for so many years. It would be based on like symbolism, like whatever our decisions were based on what God was saying, or, you know, we had to interpret dreams and visions and all that kind of stuff. And now you just look, you look, we look at the cold hard facts of things and you can make so much easier decisions. Um, you know, I, I live in the nicest place in the world, I think. Um, still in love with my husband. I got a cute little house here. I just love my life. We just bought a sailboat. Never sailed a day in our lives. <laughs> awesome. what we're going to learn. So you're probably, I don't know, you know, just doing a bunch of normal stuff. Because I know for me, I don't know if it was the same for you. It was like, well, I mean, because you were mentioning earlier, too, that when you first started going to church and probably throughout your entirety of it would just go to everything, go, go, yeah. go, soaking it all in. So to go, go, go so much and then all of a sudden not have anywhere to go or anything to do. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I remember it's like. Like that did first. You, did you ever feel guilty for just relaxing, doing something normal? Oh, I, I, I still have. I still, there's still remnants of guilt that um, is with me if I have free time, because free time back then was time that you should have been spending with the Lord. <laughs> you yeah. should, you know, you should get up early and stay up late and get in your prayer closet and, um, yeah. you know. Um, but I remember getting up in the morning after, I mean, I thought that when I retired, my plan, when I retired here was I was going to write a Christian book. I was going to have like a little ministry. I was going to do all the same stuff, um, here that I did everywhere else that I moved. Um, and when all of that was gone, I would remember sitting in on the couch in the morning thinking, I literally don't know what to do today. Like, I don't know how to live. I don't know, like, what do people do if you don't have, like, the prayer and the worship and, and you know, ministering to other people and you don't have all of these, um, you know. It was my whole life. It was my, it, it was my whole life. 
and coping mechanisms too. It's like the way that you cope with real yes. life. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of learning who I am, and um, I feel so much better about myself. I feel like I live a genuine, authentic life. Um, I don't do what I don't want to do, and I pretty much can do what I want to do. Um, which I guess some people will, will say, see, I knew she just wanted to sin. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I just, uh, my it life really without weird. God is just, is, is great. I'm not sad and depressed and hopeless like most uh, theists think that atheists are. Yeah. I got a very full life. Great. Yeah. Probably so much time for your family, like actual time with your family. and. Yeah with Sheldon and just yeah. doing things that actually fill your cup. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's good. You know, like, it's good. Weird to imagine you being super strict and fundamentalist. <laughs> I was. You just seem so, you know, free and. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, the funny thing is, is I thought that I was free and progressive when I was a Christian. I mean, how many yeah. songs did we sing about being free, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I could give you a, a name of a dozen songs off the top of my head with the words free, freedom in it. And looking back now, thinking that that was freedom seems so silly to me. Like it's such a small world, it's so tiny. It's a yeah. very small, restricted, limited um, point of view. And we, yet we sang and danced around and we prayed and, and, and sang about Jesus being our healer. And yet people were dying of breast cancer. You know, yeah. um, you just chalk all those things up to the mysteries of the Lord and you just keep on dancing, keep on praying. And yeah, yeah. Well, I can't see, I, 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 when you look back at it, it looks so obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. It's like, it, it's so obvious that it's laughable. And yeah. I feel, I feel embarrassed that yeah. I believed in it, but then also not embarrassed because so many other people were duped too. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, and that's and that's the the sad thing. Although you know, there's going through deconstruction is a difficult thing, and uh, some people I don't think some people would be able to handle it. Um, so I don't. There's some people that I don't talk about. Um, you know, atheism too, because because of that. I mean, some people just really want to believe and. And, yeah. uh, they, you know, don't get, don't let facts get in the way of their, of their belief. So, yeah. Yeah. I totally know what you mean where it's just, there's no point because they're that stubborn. They just want to hold on. Yeah. It's too much. Yeah. 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 That's right. Cause I mean the deconstruction, I mean, it lasts years. It can last a lifetime. Yeah. Depending on how indoctrinated you were. Absolutely. Even now when there's like something bad happens to somebody, um, it's hard to find the words to convey sympathy and support and encouragement and love to somebody when you don't have, I'll pray for you to fall back on. And uh, those are the times like now, like if my, if one of my kids go through something, those are the times, the only times now that I think, oh, I wish that I could pray and it do something. You know, yeah. I, I miss prayer in those times because I really thought that it felt like we were doing something. We were actually impacting something. And now I'm just left with having to express my thoughts to somebody, which, you know, it, it's you got to be really. Um, you know, you, uh, I don't know how to explain what I'm saying, <laughs> you know, um, 
when you can't say, when you can't say that you'll pray for somebody, you got to really come up with why you love this person is is what I'm trying to, to say. You know, it makes you be a more generous, honest, loving person because you have to reach down deep. You don't have that quick go to. I'll pray for you. Answer, yeah, is what I'm trying to say. I totally know what you mean. I mean, uh, when somebody when when somebody has a disease or their uh, family yeah. member of theirs has died or yeah. uh, somebody has lost their job or yeah. can't they can't get pregnant something very heart wrenching. Yeah, that you have to try to conjure something up yeah. and not go on these defaults that you would yeah. go for. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that, I think that's why I feel like a more genuine person because now I don't have those pat answers to go to, you know, I don't, have, I, I, I can't just tell somebody, Oh, God will work it out or it's all in God's plan or, you know, any of those stupid things that people um, <laughs> say when you're going, when you're going through crap, um, yeah. And now I can really be there for the person. Now I can really say, you know, what you're going through is really bad and, you know, and I'm sorry you're going through it. And I think that is even more meaningful than thoughts and prayers. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. So, um, what advice would you give to someone who was in a position that you and Sheldon were in five or six years ago when it, let's say, let's say that maybe they were or are in a church and yeah. weren't lucky. Like you guys were in the way of not having to leave, but being caught up in a whole world where you're believing in these delusions, what advice yeah give to somebody who's maybe um, starting to see some of that? I would give somebody the advice to uh, always keep learning and keep your mind open. Make sure that your mind is open. I mean, I always thought that I had an open mind to all of these things. And then I realized that I, that I didn't. Um, and also to reach out to someone because you're definitely not alone in your struggle in your deconstructing of your doctrine or your beliefs. Um, there's a lot of people who are going through the same thing. So my biggest advice would be to reach out to, um, to somebody on online on social media or, you know, the clergy project. There's a lot of great organizations out there, but just don't be alone. Find somebody else. There is support out there. Recovering from religion recovering from is one of my religion. favorite. That's one of my favorite organizations. <laughs> and then yeah. clergy project, and then we also have the secular therapy. Yeah. Project. Yeah. You were mentioning that is also within the clergy project. Uh, the clergy project will provide subsidized payment towards. 12 sessions with the secular therapy project. Yeah. And uh, you can go on and choose a therapist either virtually or locally to you. And it, it's a really pretty easy website to use, you know, and you can choose your therapist by their specialties. And there's also career training that the clergy project yeah offers as well. And so those two things are uh, the main, the main things that are a lot of our money donations go towards. Yeah. As well. Yeah. And you can, you can donate to the clergy project too, by going to the clergy project.org website. And then down, if you scroll down and on the right hand side, there's a donate button there as well. Yeah, and it's so a great, it's a great place to donate money. Um, like I said, I was a recipient of those 12 free uh, counseling sessions with a secular therapist. And she, so she knew what I was going through, you know, and that made all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a huge difference for sure. 
because I always had a lot of really bad luck when I was trying to find a therapist after yeah. all that stuff. It, to not to not look at uh, some of the stuff that we had been through as trauma, you know. Yes, yes, absolutely. A lot of people would not see it as as the trauma that it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember going into one doctor's office and there was a, a little plaque on his desk saying, "With God, all things are possible." And I was like, "I'm not in the right place. <laughs> I don't think this is gonna work." Have you ever seen that meme where it mentions that and then it's like, um, there's a guy, there's a guy just sitting there sitting back and he goes, do, do a double back backflip right now. I dare you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So with the clergy project, it is also wanting to mention that it is a discreet online forum. It's a discreet website, hidden website. So when you when you go to apply to the clergy project, you can do that on the website and you have you'll get contacted by a screener that's you know volunteers for the clergy project, one yeah. of our members, and they'll screen you with a with various questions and basically wanting to know your history what you did in the ministry the and wanting to double check that you don't believe in any of the supernatural and if you've left if you're planning on leaving and to understand that there are members in the clergy project that do not want to give away their identity they yeah. don't want to come out yet so you have to understand the anonymity that mm. some of them have so yeah. that's part of the screening process so when you go through all of that and they screen you then they'll call you back or email you however they i can't remember how they contact i think maybe it was by email and they'll let you know if you've been accepted into the clergy project at that point you'll be given a login and password to access the online forums that have been available there since the beginning, uh, 2011. So just endless, endless amounts of forums of all these stories of other yeah. ex-clergy that have left and were a part of the clergy project. Yeah. And so there are a lot of names out there that, you know, a lot of us may know, but as a whole, there's about 1,200 members right now. And so it really is not a huge group, but there is a lot of information on there, a lot of yeah. really great stories. Yes. Yeah. You'll have access to that. Plus, we have a, a hidden Facebook group, too, where we keep in contact. Right. With each other. Yeah, it's a it's a really good, um, I'm, I, the Facebook group in particular is really good for I find for support and um, community, you know, um, definitely we don't have that church community anymore. And so, yeah. Um, and there's people who have been deconstructed for a long time and then there's like newbies in there and everybody's just kind of um, supporting each other, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, really great. Yeah. It really is great. So if there's anybody that's watching or any that, you're in this position or you know somebody that's in this position to go check out the clergy project so just go to clergyproject.org and you can find all sorts of things the how to apply on there um and as well as donating you can read some of the stories you can follow our twitter and um catherine for you is there anything specific that you want to mention before we go? Um, no, I don't think so. Thanks for having me. Um, I've enjoyed it. Um, uh, I'm sorry for rambling. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, you didn't. Listen, we're all ex, we're all ex preachers. So you got to expect 
long-winded people. <laughs> and I was like, at one point, I, I got to just gra grab my tea, and I'm like, all right, I don't even have to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't but, throw your head back and say, how much longer is this going to go on? <laughs> let me know when it's done, and I'll turn it off. <laughs> No, it was really good talking to you. It was, I, I'm glad I finally you got too. to hear some of that. You too. We'll have to do something else together again soon. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked um, the one, the episodes that we did where we went through some of the ridiculous yeah. story Bible. Yeah. When we don't have to be too serious. Do yeah. another one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could do one on the, on the crazy things we did in church. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh i got some stories <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> okay well, you. well it's good to see you thanks for telling your story thanks for um being vul vulnerable and uh thank you everybody for watching thanks my darling <laughs> bye yeah.